Hello, I'm Jeff Lucas, and during this season of Remembrance, I'd like us to reflect on the life of one man who daily risked his life in the hellish trenches of the First World War. His name was Geoffrey Ankertel Studdard Kennedy. He was a voluntary chaplain, the first chaplain to set up his vicarage in the horrendous danger zone of the frontline trenches. He had a rather unusual missional strategy, a satchel full of New Testaments and then an almost endless supply of Woodbine cigarettes. I think the Reverend Kennedy thought that if he could offer men the latter, perhaps they'd be interested in the former. He was to become chaplain to the king, but to the thousands of men in the trenches, he was known simply as Woodbine Willie. A vicar here? Yes. I don't expect any garden parties or jumble sales any time soon. I'm the Reverend Geoffrey Ankertel stood at Kennedy. You can call me Willie for short. Well, thank God for that. I hope you will. What the hell are you doing out here, Padre? Not too different from my church back home, to be honest. Keep your head down, hard seats and pray a lot, just like home. <laughs> I'll tell you two lads the same thing I tell every new recruit. This vicarage is open to you any time you want, morning, noon or night, all right? You might not think you want it now, but you will one day, I can guarantee it. Some days, I have a queue all down that trench and right round the corner. It's the same back home in Worcester. Well, not the trenches, of course. But a steady flow through the vicarage front door. Sad, lonely, anxious, suicidals. Drug takers, drunks. That's just the bishop. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> They must miss you. They're surprised they let you go. A parish is a parish, wherever you end up, lad. I was a curate in rugby, a vicar in Worcester, now a padre in Belgium. Always had the same philosophy. Go out onto the highways and the byways, compel the men to come in. If they don't come in, well, that's all right. Stick out there on the byways with them. You want it in a nutshell, that's why I'm here. Look, hold the sermon for now, vicar. I need a fag and a toilet. A fag? I can always help you with. Thank you. Come to me any time you want. I've got plenty. Eh? A toilet's a bit tricky. You'll find a bucket round the back. If it's not overflowing, it's all yours. Good luck. Cheers. Oh, uh, Johnny Dixon, by the way. Shake your hand now rather than later. Might be pleasanter all round. Yeah, I see what you mean. Good to meet you, Johnny Dixon. Cheers. Um, George Barlow. Good to meet you, George Barlow. Where are you from? Oh, just outside King's Lynn. Yeah. I've never been further than Norwich before this lot. Is that right? <laughs> well, uh, you're not in Norwich now. No, no. Uh, wh where did you say you were from again? Worcester. So we'll be all right for mustard and sauce, eh? 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 Never mind. You want a cup of tea, lad? Oh, please. Yeah, yeah. I hope you take it black. How oh, come? There's no milk. There's a war on you, no? There's no sugar either, but there we are. Good luck. Uh, thanks. Hey, uh, are you handy with a shovel? Oh, you need, need to go as well, no, do you, No, 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 no. Sit down, sit down, sit down. No, 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 no. It's new instructions from headquarters. You've seen the ridge over there, I take it? Yeah. Well, the Air Corps, they tried to go over it, and some of the lads tried to go through it. And now you... And the Aussies, who have just arrived, you're going down under, as they say. <laughs> Dig a tunnel under the ridge, lay some explosives, and then run like hell out of there as quick as you can. This looks like hell already. <sighs> no, lad, this can't be hell. We've got tea for a start, eh? There's no tea in hell, not even without milk. If you say so. I do say so. When did you sign up? Oh, about six months ago. Uh, I told my family I'd be home by Christmas. It's the Germans who deserve hell, Padre, not us lot. You know something? I believe God's on our side, lad. I do, really. But I also believe no one deserves hell. And I wouldn't make any early plans for Christmas if I was you. 
Those tunnels will take months to dig out. Hey, I've got something. How about a dry biscuit to go with your tea? Huh? Thanks, sir. <laughs> More tea, Vicar? Very good. <laughs> now then, tell me something. You got anyone waiting for you in uh, just outside King's Lynn, lad? Thanks. Yeah, a mother who can't close her eyes at night oh, yeah. because of what she imagines. And a girl I've been walking out with almost a year now. Annie Sullivan's her name. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. She's 23. She smiles a lot. Her dad's a farmer. Uh, older brother James is out here somewhere. I'll, I've got a picture. I'll show you if you like. I'd like that very much indeed. There she is. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's a beauty, all, She's right. A beauty all right. I, I yeah. see what you mean about the smile. She's lovely, yeah. yeah. She reminds me of that song. Uh, you must know it. The sunshine of your smile. <laughs> know it? It's my little party piece, lad. I sing it to the boys in the trenches. Just when they think it can't get any worse, I stand up and do a tearful ballad for them. <laughs> Suddenly the trenches aren't so bad after that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whenever I think of her, I always picture her walking through a field in summer or down a country lane on a spring morning. It's, it's never winter. That's a lovely thought to have, lad. It really is. She stayed smiling even when we said goodbye. She said that's, uh, that's how I should remember her. Yeah. I sneaked a, a look back as I was leaving. She was crying in the arms of her mother. I shouldn't look back. I was in tears myself for over an hour in front of the lads. What sort of first impression's that? An honest one. And a brave one. What about you, Padre? Who prays for you? You married? 1914. Quite a significant year for me. My dear father died. I became vicar of St. Paul's in Worcester. Britain declared war on Germany. You remember that? Yeah. And most significant of all, I married Emily Catlow. The beautiful spring afternoon in Leeds. She became my wife. My partner. My friend. And she prays for me every day. I know that much. She'll pray for you, you know, and young uh, uh, Johnny. Johnny, yeah. yeah. Why not tell her all about you? And she cries. When I'm looking the other way, she cries. And like all of them back home, lads, she sits, she waits, she prays. She cries. I'm holding here a letter that is very precious to me. It was written back in 1942 from the British Red Cross Society, informing my grandparents that my father, who'd been missing in action for six months, nobody knew if he was alive or dead, but this letter told them that he was safe and being held as a prisoner of war. I can only imagine the smiles of joy and the tears of relief that were shared as this letter arrived in the post. In our story, Woodbine Willie meets young George Barlow and they, they have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. They talk about smiles and George shares about Annie, his girlfriend back home, her, her radiant smile that lights up his day. And then Willie talks about his party piece, the song that he inflicts upon the hapless troops in the trenches, the sunshine of your smile. But then these two men talk about tears as well, the tears that George tries to hide as he has to leave his family to go off to war. And then Willie reciprocates. He talks about his wife, Emily, the tears that she sheds. Willie says... She sits, she waits, she prays, she cries. Surely these are poignant words for us as we've been navigating through this 
horrendous COVID-19 season, the most cataclysmic event for most of us in our entire lifetimes, this, this season of lockdown, apocalyptic headlines, fears about the economy, about unemployment, exam chaos, children not being able to go to school, and then, of course, sickness and the grief of death in many families. Smiles have perhaps been in shorter supply during recent days. We too, we sit, we wait, we pray, and we cry. And in the midst of all of that, we, we ask the question, is there a God? And if there is, does he really care? There are some who view God as some kind of distant Wizard of Oz character sitting slightly to the right of Jupiter with one eyebrow raised in mild interest, but not really caring, not really passionate. But when we look at the Bible, we discover a God who is passionate about you, about me. The prophet Hosea in the Old Testament describes a God whose heart is churned within him. He's pictured as a mother who is mood for her children as a, an ecstatic father who runs out delirious with joy because his wayward prodigal son is returning home. God is described as being grieved and angry and pleased. He sings, he claps, he even dances for joy. He's the God who has acted. Emily sits and she waits but God is not the God who just sits passively and unmoved. As we consider the great sacrifice of previous generations, let's also know the greatest sacrifice in the whole of human history, as God sent his son Jesus to live, to show us the way to live, and then in a way that's difficult to fully understand, to go to the cross, to lay down his life for us. God is passionate. He is moved. He has taken action. Today, we look back. We are grateful. We are celebrating the greatest sacrifice and the greatest victory in history. The victory of Jesus. God cares. That bucket was full of vomit. Bits of bones all over the shop. Some sod's hand just stuck out the side of the trench. It might as well have been his grave. It probably was his grave. When it's like this, we don't get time for proper burial. The trench has to make do. If there's time, we'll pull him out later. If it's a boy I'm thinking about, it's young Tommy Watts. I wrote to his dear mother last night. Barlow, try and clean it up. Thanks, George. Thanks, Father Joy. You don't want to know the words I was using back there, Vicar. Felt so sick I could have filled the bucket up with my own vomit. There are a few words, foul or filthy enough, to describe war. I can give it a go if you like. <laughs> yeah. Cup of tea for you, lad? Oh, yeah, cheers. Milk, two sugars. <laughs> Ever considered taking your tea black, no sugar? Not especially. Now's the time to start. Good luck with that. I'm going to take a guess here, Johnny. You didn't volunteer for this lark, did you? You must be joking. Why would you? <laughs> no, I thought I'd get away with it as well. Then it came in May. Conscription for married men. I read that 40% of the blokes getting called up are unfit for duty or stuck in some comfy desk job. Not me. I one I was. <laughs> Doing gardening work before this lark, you see? Out in all sorts of weathers. Never as much as a cold. Oh, yeah. Hey, your gardening skills might come in handy out here. I come. Well, I was just telling young um, George. Uh, George Barlow, yeah. He, um, it's, it's the new instructions from headquarters, the ridge. We've got to dig tunnels under it, blow them all up to Timbuktu. Well, it sounds more fun than leapfrogging through no man's land. Funny how running at a machine gun doesn't seem to get you very far these days. True. 
Might give us a respite from the slaughter, eh? You must be a dab hand at doing funerals now, Vicar. I'm sad to say I am. I always preferred weddings back home. Standing at the front of the church, looking out, everyone smiling, the bride and groom smiling, all the congregation smiling, everyone was smiling, apart from the bride's father who's thinking, how much is this going to cost me? <laughs> I got married on the cheap. Did you? Yeah, I did it at a registry office during my lunch hour. My brother just about made it to be best man. Forgot the rings. Had to improvise something with a coat hanger. Really? Listen, is your brother out here? No, he's asthmatic. He's a caretaker at a school. Probably be on his lunch hour now. Yeah, he'll be in the boiler room with the Daily Mirror. Strong mug of beef tea. <laughs> Lucky git. You, uh, got any brothers and sisters? Me? Yeah, one or two. Mabel, Nora, Eve, Francis, Rachel, Robert, John, Sarah, Edmund, Cicely, Gerald and myself. You Catholic? <laughs> no, but close. My father was Irish, but he moved to Leeds. I grew up there. He was a vicar, Church of England. We always made sure the front two pews were jam-packed solid. Sunday school was like a family reunion every week. <laughs> but they miss you, eh? Not my brother. Oh, really? Yeah, he wouldn't even come and have a drink with me to see me off. This war, you know, it... Um, it affects people in different ways. <laughs> even back home, it does strange things to them. It's done it to my mother. Is that right? Yeah. She's moved her bed downstairs. She can't explain it, but she reckons if she goes upstairs at night, she'll get bad news. Preach on that. Well, you were part of the routine for her for years. She doesn't want to think of anything that might break the routine. That's the thing. It's not easy for them. None of this. None of this is easy. Not here, not for them either. Well, look, you've got enough siblings to fill a hockey team. Surely one of them misses you. I hope so. Particularly my youngest brother, Gerald. We did everything together. He encouraged me, I encouraged him. We got into Leeds Grammar about the same time. We used to read. We used to love reading. We sit upstairs on the landing, reading aloud from my mother's battered copy of the Pilgrim's Progress. Hey, he used to like my poetry back then, and it wasn't very good, I can tell you. But I won the, uh, the public speaking prize at Leeds Grammar two years in a row. Hey? Always like being in front of a crowd, have you? I don't mind it. If it's something I like, if it's something I know about, interested in, I don't mind talking about it. I like bunion. Bunions? You're an expert on foot points as well? Eh? No, not bunions. Bunion. John Bunion. The Pilgrim's Progress, lad. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I can't say I've read it. Come to evening prayers tonight. I'm talking all things bunion. You might learn something. Take that. Cheers. Barlow, is it cleaned up? I did what I could. All right. On your feet, soldier. What? Oi! As we listen in to these conversations from the trenches, we realise that one of the greatest challenges that we human beings face is that of loneliness. John Donne famously said that no man, no body is an island. We've certainly seen that to be true in recent days as Residents in care homes have hungrily received hugs through plastic sheeting as their relatives have come visiting and as grandparents have lamented their inability to cuddle their grandkids. I know, I'm one of those grandparents. You see, it's so vital that we belong, that we're part of community, of family. Every Remembrance Day, I celebrate and remember my family and especially my dad, that young prisoner of war that I mentioned earlier. I showed you that letter from the Red Cross and about a year later another letter arrived, this time from the Army Infantry Record Office, informing my grandparents that my dad had been relocated from a prison camp in Italy 
to Stalag 8B in Germany. But this was not the last relocation that he would experience because the Nazis realized towards the end of the war that the Russians were advancing in the area where my father was being held. They could hear the sound of the Russian artillery in the distance. And so the Nazis came up with the plan. It became known as the Death March. As in the coldest winter in a hundred years, they herded a hundred thousand men across Germany. And it was brutal. Men were soiling themselves as they stumbled along. And if you fell, you'd get a rifle butt in the back of the neck or a bullet to the head. As the march rounded a corner, my father noticed that he could not see a sentry ahead, and that meant that he couldn't be seen. And the same was true as he looked behind him. And so he took an immediate decision, nudging a friend. He said, come on, let's run. I'm so glad and grateful that he made that choice. It's very likely that had he not, obviously I wouldn't be here today. I'm grateful for family. Willie, Woodbine Willie, shares that he's got enough siblings to fill a hockey team. And as Johnny hears about that, we sense that his heart is aching. There's a pain in his family that we don't fully understand. His mother really cares for him. She refuses to sleep upstairs while he's away at war because she's got this superstitious idea that if she does so, bad news will come. But then Johnny's brother barely shows up for Johnny's wedding. And when he does, he forgets the ring. There's a sadness, an aching about Johnny. He's hungry for family. The Christian message is an invitation to know God, but it is also an invitation for us to be known as part of the family of God. I'm talking about the church. Now, I know the church is flawed and broken. Many wonderful things have been done in the name of Jesus. And as we look back, there's some horrible history as well. But we are called, invited to be together. T.S. Eliot said, what is life if we have not life together? We're all invited to become part of the family of God. And so Willie invites Johnny to become part, to join in with a, an evening prayer gathering, to become part of a praying community. He's saying, Johnny, come on, you can belong. Of course, the question is, how will Johnny respond? You uh, should have chosen an easier parish, Padre. Yeah, right. Yeah. A Padre's place is where there's most danger of death. Well, thanks for the reminder. Yeah. <laughs> I said when I took this job on, send me where the lads are. If I'm not taking their risks, I'm not doing my job. What are you doing? You could pray for us in your vicarage back garden. Don't need to be here for that. I don't want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. And I've got to be here to do that. Understand? I've, uh, I've got a letter to my Annie. Would you read it over for me later? Yeah. Check for spelling. My, my English is none too clever. <laughs> of course it will, lad. I'll, I'll do it a bit later, all right? Yeah, fine. And you? And any letters going home, lad? Uh, no point. The missus won't be there to read them. Oh. What, what about your little boy? But neither are at home. So there's little chance of them missing me, all right? All right. Is there anything I can do? Let me know. Yeah, I'll make an appointment at the vicarage, shall I? And all the other anxious, lonely, sad drunks. Shall I bring a bottle? Very kind, but no need. I've got ample supplies. Come and find me after evening prayers if you want to chat. I need to go and uh, pray with young Jimmy Simpson. He's going downhill fast after the gas attack. Bloody gas. Kills the rats for a while. There's something at least. Simpson was my age. Yeah, he won't be for much longer.
to my lovely Annie. Jerry's gone quiet for a bit, so I thought I would uh, try and write a few words to you. I will ask Padre to read over for me, you know, for spelling. You'd like him. He talks about his faith and his fags in equal measure. I don't want you to worry too much about me. Get that dry flower you gave me in my pocket. Thank you. I haven't told the others. It reminds me of you every day. Well, and Norfolk. There's a Welsh man called Thomas who's trying to grow flowers in the trenches. I saw some marigolds this morning. Rations aren't too bad at the moment. We got bacon, tea, and a biscuit from the government. I never thought I'd say this, but I miss a bar of soap. The dirt and the mud and the stench of rats gets everywhere. If you get a moment, please check on Mother for me and tell her I miss her. I'd appreciate that very much. Thank you, Annie. I miss you every day. I showed Padre your photograph and he said that, well, he, he liked your lovely smile. That's what keeps me going. All my love. George. Death. Let's face it, it's not a subject that we like to chat about often. Woody Allen said, it's not that I'm afraid of dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. As Woodbine Woolley talks about how he wants to be in the place of danger and even death, George reacts a little like, thanks for the reminder. But we need to face the reality of death. It's been said that the statistics on death are fairly impressive. One out of every one person dies. I can remember standing in the fields of Flanders on a battlefield site that turned into a cemetery, the thousands of young men who perished in that awful war. Christians can feel that if we talk about death and dying and eternal life, that that's all a bit pie in the sky. But, but the truth that Christ has beaten death sits at the very heart of Christianity. The story of Jesus did not end at the cross because three days later he was raised again from the dead. The New Testament teaches us that if Christ is not raised, then this whole Christian message, well, frankly, it's a waste of time. We who follow Christ, and if you become a follower of Jesus, it's not that you relish death, but you can stare it down and know that Jesus is is victorious over it. I remember the day when I had to go and pick up my dad in the car and I frankly wasn't looking forward to it because the location was an undertaker's. I had to pick up a box of ash, the result of his funeral and cremation. And I remember coming out to the car and putting the box on the passenger seat and thinking, I used to have a dad and now I've got a box of ash. And at that moment, just to be really honest, the thought of life after death and resurrection, it all seemed completely impossible. And let's face it, it is impossible. But the Bible says that with God, all things are possible. And so that day, I remember being able to say, Dad, it's not farewell. It's good night. I'll see you in the morning resurrection morning. Jesus offers us the gift of God, which is eternal life. But like all gifts, it needs to be gladly received by faith. Vicar. Padre. I met one of your parishioners the other day. Did you now? Yeah, over in the... Uh... Uh, yeah, Worcestershire Regiment. Uh, Roger Bellamy, I think his oh, name was. Yeah, I know him well. Oh, yeah, he loves you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he even gave me some cock and bull story about you giving him your bed. That's right. You what? I said, that's right. You gave him your bed? That's right. What was wrong with it? Nothing. So why'd you give it him? Well, yeah. Roger, his wife, Maggie, they live in Blockhouse. Poorest part of Worcester. I went over to see them not long ago. Nine kids at least between them. Not a decent bed. 
So I went home, dismantled my bed, and took it round to their place a bit later. Your wife must have been cock a hoop. It was a bit of a surprise to her, I must admit, yes. But she came round to the idea. She helped me carry the mattress over later. <laughs> you really don't fit the vicar mould, do you? I'll tell you something, shall I? I've done everything I can to break the vicar mould, as you put it. Have you ever heard of St Francis? Is he the dog one? No, that's St Bernard. This is a different one, St Francis. I don't blame you. Lived a long time ago. Anyway, he decided to give up his uh, life of luxury and, uh, and, uh, and good times and give all he had to the, the poor, the man on the street. Yeah. Why? Because he went back to the Bible, you see, and what did he find? Here's a surprise. Jesus talks more about the poor <laughs> and the needy than he ever does about religious dogma of the day. How about that? Never really got that impression from church, to be honest. Never read a Bible then, have you? No. Got given a gospel when we first arrived. It made me smile, keep this with you and read it every day. Yeah. I mean, I certainly did use it every day for a while. The uh, latrines, they didn't have any bumps. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> never mind about that for now. Here. I have another one. Happy Christmas. Try and keep it clean, will you? I don't blame you for what you say about the church, of course. Yeah, understandable. It's not a place for just sitting in a neat row in your Sunday best, cold, being told what to do or what not to do. That's not what it's about. It's a place to go to and find out a little bit more about Jesus every week. That's what it's about, nothing more. It's for the poor, it's for the rich. It's for the young, it's for, the, it's for everybody, lad. All right. I'll read it. Thanks. Do something else. When you've read it, let me know what you think about it. There's a beautiful moment when Woodbine Willie says, it's for everyone, lad. What's for everyone? Well, it's this Christian message that God loves all of us, that he is passionate about us and has come to rescue us. That is why Jesus came, to live and to die for us, to be raised from the dead, inviting us not only to begin a journey of life with him that will last forever but also become part of the Christian family, the community, the church and having the ability then to live and die knowing that we've received the gift of God which is eternal life. It's for everyone. One last word about my dad because you know his story didn't end with that box of ash. A few years prior to that our parents my parents were visiting us in America and for reasons that I can't fully describe, one Sunday morning, right at the end of a church service, I noticed that my dad was quietly weeping. I wandered over to him and knelt in front of him and said, Dad, what's, what's going on? <clears throat> he, said, he said, son, I want to become a Christian. I want to do that right now. That was a bright and beautiful day. The message was for him. The message is for all of us, for me, for you. Whatever the stench is in our lives, whatever the things are that we want to leave in the outhouse. Let me just bring us back, if I may, to that moment on that death march where my dad realised that he had come to a place of choice. In that situation, he only had a few seconds to decide to continue on the march, continuing in the same direction and perhaps to an untimely end or to choose life. He made a run for it and I'm glad that he did. Becoming a Christian is a choice. And as we look back during this season and remember, grateful for the sacrifices of so many, this is a moment to look around 
and consider our lives. Where do we stand with God? And then make a choice as we move forward that will wonderfully change the trajectory of our lives forever. As you know, I grew up in a beautiful, picturesque part of England. We call it Leeds, just outside. And it was beautiful. There were fields and, and trees and a lake, ideal for such a big family. We were out there climbing trees and playing rugby and football and cricket and swimming in the lake, coming back caked in mud from top to toe. We'd often put me at odds, well, all of us at odds with our dear mother. Because she loved to keep our house, our house, spotless, clean, not a thing out of place. She loved to see us out there playing, covered in mud, but she loved to have a spotless house. So something would have to give here. Hence the creation by my father of the outhouse. Yeah, the outhouse. That was the place to deposit anything that might stain the immaculate interior of the house. So football boots and rugby boots and, 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 and raincoats and, and cricket bats and walking sticks and Wellington boots. Anything that would stain the interior of the house would be left in the outhouse. House, And then, and only then, would my mother welcome us home with open arms. And she loved nothing more than welcoming her family home. Some of you here, unsurprisingly, with what awaits you tomorrow, has asked me about heaven. What's heaven going to be like, Padre? Give us a clue, will you? I will. You see, in my opinion, heaven is a wonderful place, spotless, immaculate, clean, not a thing out of place. The outhouse, though, is, is not in heaven. The outhouse is here on earth. Here's the place to deposit anything that might stain the immaculate interior of heaven. What those things are, I don't know. Only you know that, lads. But I know this much. With certainty. When the time is right, Jesus can't wait to welcome his family home. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, lads. Amen. Keep safe, eh? Nice All right, George, day. take care. All right, lads. I uh, wanted to say thank you. And well, it's for you. Take your head fast with you. It's no, all right. It's, it's, it's yours. Ha. That's very kind of you, but I've got ample supply, as you know. No, I, I don't think you understand me, Padre. I want to leave it in the outhouse. I see. My wife, as I told I you, is not waiting for me back at home. Because of this? Too much of it, far too, far too much of it. I was coming home drunk most nights. I'd use what little money we had to spend on it. Worst of all, I started to take it out on her. <laughs> and she didn't want Robert to see me like that. So one night I came home, drunk of course, and she'd gone. It's not, it's not that my brother didn't want to see me off when I went. It's just that he didn't want to meet me in a public house. He could see what it was doing to me. I couldn't. I guess you'd, 
guess you just see things in a different light out here. Yeah. Well, if, if you're sure that's what you want. Uh, yes. We'll put it in the outhouse then, shall we? I'll bury it deep in the trench tomorrow morning. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for talking to me. I appreciate it. And your dear wife will appreciate it as well, I'm sure. And young Robert. But I'd like to say this, Johnny, if I may. Don't pretend. Mean it this time. You've got a real chance to be a, to be a hero to, 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 to young Robert in more ways than one now. Yeah. I'll write her, I'll write her tonight. Yeah, do that. I think I'll write to my mother as well. That's a good idea, yeah. I find myself thinking of her. Most nights I can't stop myself from picturing her downstairs. Just... I can't. I try to hold back the tears. Most of the time I fail. Tears are nothing to be ashamed of, lad. Not here. There are lads crying for their mothers in these trenches every night of the week without fail. Could you, uh, could you add, could, uh, add a note or, or just something to it just to put a mind at ease? Just... Of course I will, if thank you're sure. You. Please, thank you. You've done a, uh, a brave thing, lad. You really have. A life-changing decision. Which reminds me, how are you getting on with that bump I got you to read? <laughs> it's, uh, it's still in one piece. Good. I just got to the bit with the uh, thief on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah, that's the one. You really believe in heaven, Potter? Of course I do. There's got to be somewhere better than here, surely. You really think God wants us here? He wants me here, I'm sure of that. I'm not so sure about you. <laughs> I used to be. I used to preach it from my pulpit. Every week in Worcester. Every able-bodied man should volunteer for active service without delay. No excuses will be acceptable. I preached it every week and I meant every single word. And now? And now? I swallow every word in shame. War is a universal disaster. Waste of muscle, waste of brain, waste of patience, waste of pain, waste of manhood, waste of health, waste of beauty, waste of wealth. Waste of blood, waste of tears, waste of youth's most precious years, waste of ways the saints have trod, waste of glory, waste of God. War. Keep your spirits up. We need you. Yeah. Hey. Before you go, take them, will you? There's a couple left. And look after young Barlow for me, will you? Hmm? Heads down. Yeah. Keep safe. Yeah. Good luck, Johnny. Thanks, Willie. As we come to the end of our time together, thanks so much for joining Searchlight Theatre Company and me for this time of remembrance and reflection. I've been talking about choices, 
And if you are a person who right now would like to say, I want to make that decision, I want to choose to become a follower of Jesus, I invite you now to begin that journey. I'm going to pray a prayer. Let me also encourage you to make contact with a local church and find yourself, place yourself in a community that can help you grow in your faith. Here's that prayer of choice, of decision. Jesus, I choose to become one of your followers today. I believe by faith that you have come to rescue me and I accept your gift of life, of eternal life. I turn from my own pathway. I turn from my sin. I ask for your grace and forgiveness and invite you to be my Lord and my King. Thank you for hearing me. In Jesus' name, I pray this prayer. Amen.